a very warm welcome uh, to all of you who have uh, joined us today to our first webinar this year. Uh, we will present to you the Swedish uh, retail market. I have a special guest with me today. And uh, we will explain if you have a food product, what recommendations and what you should think about when you want to target or enter the Swedish market. But before we start, uh, my name is Constanza McDonald and I'm a trade policy advisor at Open Trade Gate Sweden, which is part of the National Board of Trade, the Swedish government for uh, international trade, the EU internal market and the trade policy. I will talk to you a little bit about OTGS. We are a team of uh, seven people today. We have different backgrounds and experiences. Some have worked with uh, trade promotion and others with the trade policy and trade regulations. So we are, very, we are a very strong team and uh, hopefully expanding and growing to a larger team uh, during this year. But our main mission for our activities and our main goal is to facilitate trade from developing economies to Sweden and to the EU. And all our services are free of charge. And uh, in one slide, I will try to show you how we work at OTGS. We have actually uh, two types of activities. We work as a point of contact and with capacity building. And uh, as a point of contact, we provide information on legal requirements and private standards, but also on market trends and other relevant information that companies need when considering the Swedish market. And we do this through, for example, this type of webinars, but also through our website where we have uh, market reports and uh, specific mail also so that you can write to us uh, your questions directly. Uh, another important uh, update information for our target groups. Um, furthermore, we have the possibility to work with capacity building in longer term projects. And uh, we do this through our BSOs or other partner organizations. And this can be either by working with building a knowledge and capacity directly with our partners abroad, but this work can be seen more as a process with several steps to reach the Swedish market. Some of these steps are uh, more complex, for example, matchmaking or participating at fairs, uh, and are actually done in a later stage of the project. It's more when we have identified uh, the need of the companies, but also matching the Swedish demand with what the partner country uh, countries offer. Uh, and we can also work with the BSOs in the partner country with capacity building in uh, working methods. But then the BSO needs to have the role actually to train further and support its company uh, that want to export to, to Sweden and the EU. Um, and this I'm really proud of is actually our road to export. It's a tool that we are working on developing further. It's a step-by-step -step guide divided into uh, five different models uh, with recommendations on how to map out the target market, how you should prepare and get ready to, to do business. And it ends with a checklist where the exporters find out uh, what information, skills and material uh, they have and what they still have to work on to be ready to, to start their export journey. Uh, this can be used directly by exporters but it can also be a good tool for TPAs, for example, to assist the companies in their export journey from a complete beginner to a more mature company. And that's the idea of this and why it's divided actually in different models. Uh, we have also developed it to different target groups and we are really happy uh, with the success and positive feedback we have received. So just a recommendation, don't miss it out and go visit our webpage where you can find all the, the information. Um, some upcoming activities um, to sum it up. Um, we will continue to work on the road to export, uh, doing trainings to different target groups, but also implemented uh, as a tool in our different projects. Um, 
we have received from the Swedish government uh, a requirement to focus more in Ukraine, Moldova, Georgia, and Armenia. And we have already uh, a few concrete activities for, for this coming months for Ukraine and Moldova, mostly uh, within the IT uh, services. Uh, but we are in the first stage for Georgia and Armenia with a pre-phase study before we can actually launch uh, the projects. Uh, we have plenty of uh, activities in our ongoing projects. Ex for example, in Bolivia, uh, we're having a food event for specific buyers now in April. And uh, in Ukraine, focusing in IT services, like I just mentioned. And uh, in Kenya, we're planning some activities with uh, companies uh, producing nuts, tea, and uh, herbs. But we are continuously uh developing our web content and both within for example export readiness uh, facts and market studies and and more webinars like this so keep an eye in our web page uh, where we publish uh, all the information um just the last slide uh, with the entire otgs team today uh, if you would like to reach out to one of us or otherwise just write to otgs at commercecollegium.se or visit our webpage opentradegate.se. Um, that was it for me. And now I will actually leave the, the screen to our uh, experts, our special guest, Jenny Kuppert, uh, a retail expert for more than, well, you can present yourself, Jenny. Ah. We're so happy to have you. So. Please, the screen is all yours. Thank you for the introduction. And uh, will you allow me just to share screen? Yes, you have it there on the uh, green bottom. Just press screen. So, thank you. And uh, sorry about the delay. Uh, hello, everyone. And uh, my name is Jenny Kapper, and I have uh, worked in the Swedish retail business for about uh, 30 years now. And I have held positions like uh, category manager, uh, buyer, business developer, business area manager. And since uh, now three years, uh, I am um, the owner of a consultancy agency, uh, working with supporting brands entering the Swedish market. Today, we will talk about uh, this uh, Swedish uh, retail market and I give, um, and to give you an overview about milestones and things to think of when entering the market. First, uh, the Nordics, why is the Nordics so uh, interesting? So uh, in total, we are 27 million people and the food industry, the turnover is 76 billion euros and the largest market is Sweden and then comes uh, uh, the others uh, Norway, Finland and Denmark and when you uh, aim for the Nordic market uh, Sweden is the biggest market in the Nordics and uh, we are about uh, 10 million people here we have a life expectancy of 83 years and uh, 86% of our population is living in urban areas. Something to think of is that uh, almost 40% uh, of all our households are single households. And that's quite unique in, in Europe to have such a high uh, rate of uh, single households, uh, meaning it could be uh, something to consider when you uh, develop pack sizes. And also something that is unique for the Nordics is that we have a high concentration of the retailers. In Sweden, uh, the market is dominated by three big players, and that is Axfood, Ica and Coop. In Finland, you have two big retailers. And in Norway, there are three, uh, three big retailers. Uh, and this means that once you get a listing in one retail store, you have access to many stores at the same time. This also means that 
uh, the market becomes attractive for international players that aim for uh, the Nordic market. So that is a retail. If you go to the whole landscape of the sales channels in Sweden, you have the uh, traditional retail chains. You also have the convenience chains, the pharmacies, the online grocery bags, Oreca uh, for the restaurant and catering services, online retailers, and the health stores. And in total, we have 3,000 stores in Sweden, and the dominating player is Ica. They uh, have 52% of the market share, and Coop, Axfood, and Bergendals. Bergendals uh, is uh, uh, connected to Axfood for their logistics. And when you're entering the market, it could be good. We have several trends uh, going on at the, uh, at the moment, like always, but there are three that are affecting uh, the market at the moment. And the first one is uh, health, wellness, wellness, and sustainability. And we have a profile, a consumer profile we call LOHAS. And LOHAS stands for Lifestyle of Health and Sustainability. And in Sweden, um, uh, or what you say, the consumer, it's an individual that includes those who want to live an enjoyable, healthy and exciting life, but not at the expense of anyone else. In Sweden, LOHA seems to be larger than anywhere else, and it is estimated to be more than 35% of the population may be regarded as LOHA individuals. And we have a long tradition in our culture to focus on sustainability and health. For instance, if you go out in our capital, Stockholm, and you ask people randomly how many owns a gym membership card, it will be 70% of the population uh, has this membership. The question is not about if they actually use the card, but still, it is a high level of people with an ambition to go to the gym. Uh, another mega trend is the clean label. And clean label uh, means that uh, the consumer, they want to know what ingredients there are in, in the product. So they avoid um, E numbers and additives you can, that cannot be explained. So when you're developing a product, think or imagine that it should be uh, ingredients that consumer recognize and they could have in their own cupboard in the kitchen. The, uh, and on the label, it is important to also uh, inform about the origin, origin and the ethical factors and also the ecological factors on, uh, uh, on the label. Uh, with the ecological factors, it doesn't mean that the uh, product has to be organic. It is more that you want to know uh, the origin of, of the product. And uh, now, because of the disruption we have uh, in the su supply chain, high fuel prices and the cost for electricity uh, leading to higher prices and uh, the inflation is driven upward, all the retailers are now uh, thinking about the consumer price. And uh, we see that the hard discount retailers are taking market shares. Those retailers have a, a more limited product offering with an efficient assortment. So they have fewer products on the shelf. Uh, consumers are buying more on promotions. In general, it is a KPI where you measure how much of everything sold in a store is sold on promotion and how, how much is sold on a regular, uh, regular price. This, um, uh, is now increasing with more people buying more products on promotion. And we also see the demand for sustainable products is decreasing. Uh, and this is for sustainable, could be, for instance, uh, labeling fair trade. Uh, the willingness to pay for these ethical products is uh, less. And we see the level of private label uh, share is increasing. And this could be an opportunity for you to develop a private labeling offering to, uh, to the market. And to the way to the, uh, to the Swedish retailers, uh, it is a launch process of six to nine months. 
And this is because you need to, we have a structure uh, with a possibility to launch product uh, twice a year in general for all the categories. And these uh, launching uh, periods, or uh, we call them trade windows, are set and decided uh, about a year, uh, one year ahead. So uh, what you do before you decide to enter the market is to uh, do the pre-study and to understand uh, the market. And once you understand the market and you have made the assessment to see if you manage to enter the market, then you decide in your company if you uh, uh, go or no go, or maybe you need to develop something more in the company before you go. And then the preparation starts uh, with the uh, value proposition and what to present to the customers. You do the customer presentations and then you are about uh, um, uh, 10 weeks before launch when you have the customer presentations. And then you get the uh, listing decision and listing is the same as an approve, you're approved to sell products in the stores. Then you prepare for an excellent uh, launch. And here I say it's, uh, it, it is the small details that makes the retail, uh, um, uh, to succeed in retail, you need to mind the details here. And with excellent launch means that you, you have the products in time on, uh, uh, in the warehouse to be able to deliver and to have all the pricing and everything set. And once you are in the shelf, you start building a uh, distribution and uh, do the investments and promotions. And now I will go more in details for every step in this uh, process. First, uh, we have this uh, trade windows. And uh, as I said, you have two opportunities every year to uh, launch the products. And the process itself starts 16 weeks uh, before the launch. And then you notify the retailers that you are interested in, in um, uh, selling a product to them. And uh, then in the notification, you present the product together with the master data. And at this stage, it is not necessary to include the price that comes when it says week four. And then you uh, present the products to the retailer. And uh, uh, then the retailer has uh, four weeks to compare your offer towards other uh, companies' uh, offers. And um, uh, after, uh, or after eight weeks or eight weeks before, uh, you are in communication with the, the retailers and they decide if you continue to step uh, next step for week nine and uh, week 10. And then uh, the process goes on. And in those steps, you also need to require the master data and all the supply chain uh, information to the retailers. And also, you need to know that once you are, have the decision to, to list the products and to the launch, it is a very short time. So that is something you need to prepare for launch in case you, uh, uh, you get the opportunity to have the products listed, uh, even though you might not get it. So here it is also something you need to plan ahead, but not uh, without taking too many costs for it. In the pre-study, you start doing a market research. And in the market research, you see where the market is heading. Uh, if, for instance, now you see the mega trend about natural products and you decide that you would like to go into uh, a category growing, maybe uh, natural snacking. If you have uh, nuts, you would like to present uh, to the retailers. You do the research to see uh, how the, the category for snacks and for nuts are growing and developing. And you see there the pack size, the prices, and uh, the competitors in the category. And then you see, is this something we can meet or not? And what is the um, requirements from uh, the national trade? What um, uh, do they require? Maybe all nuts are not uh, allowed to uh, be supplied in Sweden. So then you must make, a, maybe it's a nut mix only containing uh, um, nuts that are allowed in the market. And uh, also you need to see maybe quality assurance schemes. What is required from the trade? 
which schemes do we need to have to be um, uh, allowed to sell in the Swedish market? And then it is also very important to understand the cost structure because it's not only to uh, the cost of the products, it's also the cost for selling the product. So you have a cost, you know your cost from X work in the factory, but then you need to add uh, the transport cost, the warehouse, the handling, and also the cost for selling the products in the market. And the cost varies depending on which category you are in. So it is one cost for ambient products like nuts and another cost if you have a chilled product uh, being in the, in the fresh category. So this is something to have an understanding of and also to understand the risks in case you send too much products or too little products or if you have scrapping in the warehouse. And then you decide, is it worth it? Go or no go. And then you decide, let's go to Sweden. Then you start preparing uh, before the launch. And uh, the first thing is to understand what product portfolio, what products to launch. And my recommendation is to have more than one product. It is very difficult to get one SQ of uh, nut mixes um, uh, approved. So then uh, my recommendation is to have a range of three or four products. Uh, to get an impact in, in the shelf. And once you have decided these uh, products uh, to present, you uh, sh uh, should test the products and evaluate the packaging and the taste. Is it a, a product that we appreciate here in Sweden or is it to, um, uh, or it, uh, does it need to be adjusted? So then uh, maybe you need to adjust uh, the product uh, for, to, um, uh, uh, to fit our taste buds or to make the packaging attractive. And we differ uh, from other markets in Europe. And here is also a heads up for mixing us with Germany or Holland. We are not like the Germans here in Sweden. And uh, for supply chain, and uh, this is also a key factor of success to have the right part of our su supply chain. Uh, chain and this is you ship the products maybe you are outside uh, EU then you need to have a, a partner that also uh, managed to do all the trade uh, documents uh, to, for, for the products and uh, it must also be cost efficient that you need a partner that uh, support you in uh, shipping the most cost efficient cost efficient um, uh, palletization and uh, handling in the warehouse. And maybe also again, if you are outside EU, you need to mind uh, the VAT regulations and set up for VAT reporting. This is not difficult. All the authorities in Sweden are very accessible and it is done um, uh, in a digital way on a website. And you can, to, I think it takes, you know, five minutes to apply for a VAT reporting or VAT registration. So this is, uh, it's not difficult, but it is something that has to be done. And maybe depending on where you're located, you also have other tariffs and regulations that is applicable to the trade. And this is also something that's good to, to um, um, be aware of before you start uh, shipping to Sweden. It can become very costly to do it uh, retroactive uh, after you have started to de deliver. And it is also uh, uh, very useful to understand the regulatory and uh, regarding the packaging and the ingredients, the labeling. And then we also have GS1. And GS1 is a system uh, with the barcodes. Uh, you probably recognize the barcode. And the GS1 standard is a global standard for uh, the flow of products, you can say, and to identify the products and to allow tracking and traceability. And in Sweden, we take this uh, information in the barcodes very seriously. So you need to know your barcodes and you, make to, you need to make it correct. One digit wrong becomes entirely entire wrong. It's not almost right. It is really wrong. Uh, 
And uh, the importance of it is because then if you have, um, we do the tracking and, and traceability all over Sweden. And in the barcode, you can identify um, uh, the product and its ingredients. So it contains a lot of information. And the barcodes you also use to transfer into different system. And this is both for the retailers, but also for logistics. And then it is also used to share if you want to share the information uh, between different um, uh, supply chains. Maybe you have one transport system uh, bringing the products uh, to Sweden, and then you have another company uh, moving the products inside Sweden when you have a domestic partner, and then it is super easy to just share the information uh, in the barcodes. Also, the consequences, if this is wrong, it is really hands-on the consequences. We have fully automatized warehouses. There are no people working there. So in case the information is wrong on a pallet or on a box, it is stuck in the warehouse. And then you need to call people out in the warehouse to uh, move uh, the pallet. And it will be connected with a fine, normally about 500 euros uh, each time it happens. And it is not only the barcode that needs to be correct, it also must be placed at the right uh, position on the pallet. And this is something you, you receive information uh, about how to do it um, uh, before shipment. But it is something, it is information, you, you should not neglect it. It is, uh, it needs to, you need to pay attention to it. And um, then, uh, before you uh, ship the products, you send in information about the weight of the pallet and the height of the pallet and how many boxes there is on a pallet. And that uh, information, it has to match reality um, uh, in the warehouse because if it is wrong amount of uh, boxes, for instance, then the weight, the total weight of the pallet doesn't match what you already have inserted in the system. So uh, again, this is not difficult, but it has to be, uh, done in, uh, be done in the right way. So, and then you um, uh, need to prepare for the customer presentation. Uh, uh, once you have pre uh, prepared the infrastructure and in the customer presentation, the customer is, um, uh, every every buyer and category manager, they have so many suppliers they are meeting uh, every week. And uh, they will take the one, uh, not the nicest products or the best color. They only care about how the product uh, will contribute to a more profitable business, how it will drive the business of the buyer. Uh, because the category managers and the buyers they are measured on how much profit they can make on a dedicated space in the retail stores. And in the presentation, you uh, present to them why uh, your product is uh, uh, superior to competition. And you also explain why the shoppers uh, will buy the product. And if you should have an insight behind it. Uh, for instance, this, you know, there are many single households in, in Sweden, then you have a smaller pack size and uh, you think because of your pack size, they will sell more uh, uh, packaging. Uh, for instance, we are working with a brand. Uh, they, have, um, uh, they have identified that uh, the bars and snacking is increasing. And they also have an insight uh, that uh, it is many women buying the bars, but they don't uh, eat it all. They leave half of the bar and they put it in the handbag and then it gets smushy and you don't eat the rest of it. So they have taken the bar, cut it into pieces and in a resealable bag. And the second insight is also uh, that many moms, they buy uh, something for kids to eat in the car. And then 
they don't want to buy a full bar because uh, the kids, they don't finish the entire bar and then they need to clean the car. So then they use this resealable bag for snacking in the car. So it is a quite simple. The idea is to take a regular bar, cut it into pieces and put it in a resealable bag. This is an insight the buyer um, wants to hear. And then once you are uh, listed and you have your products in the shelf, it is also important to support sales because uh, the uh, main keep eye uh, for a retailer is how big is the rotation, meaning how many products will you sell every week. And uh, so then you need to uh, uh, show them how you support sales. And this could be with uh, tasting in store or uh, maybe a promotion in social media or you're working with an ambassador. Somehow you need to, to show them the ambition uh, to, uh, to support the sales out from stores. And if you manage to tick these three things, your product will be listed. So welcome to Sweden. Now the real work starts uh, to do after the decision, but before the launch. Now the, the work starts, you need to um, and make uh, pack shots to the online stores as well as to the uh, regular stores. And uh, these pack shots are also uh, used for the planograms. And the planograms is, it is like a map uh, for people working in the supermarkets, how to place the products. And then they need to, ha to have pictures. Uh, you need a marketing plan for uh, execution and a partner that will support you in uh, executing uh, the activities. And in-store material, maybe you would like to have a small sign or a wobbler uh, to uh, um, make your product stand out from the shelf. And you also need to have a forecast. You have probably shared a forecast internally, but now it is a proper forecast for production to make sure you can deliver the volumes, estimated volumes the first six months. And you need to deliver the products prior to launch. And if you have an ambient product, it should be in your warehouse uh, three weeks before uh, the launch, uh, because uh, first time you have some uh, paperwork to do, and then also to move the products from uh, your uh, dedicated warehouse to the retailers. This doesn't go for products with private label. And you should have uh, uh, also to uh, select a sales partner to present you in Sweden for sales. And also the, the role of the sales partner is to execute activities in, in the stores and also uh, take a responsibility like maybe a customer service in case uh, things happen between your warehouse and the shelf. So it is just to take the responsibility from the warehouse out to the shelf. And if you uh, are working with field sales, you need someone with expertise to also manage the field sales because uh, field sales uh, are the sales reps visiting the stores uh, on your behalf and they do what you ask them to do. So this is something to keep in mind uh, that you need to, uh, you cannot uh, uh, buy a service uh, from a company saying, please drive distribution for this brand and then leave it. Uh, it is uh, something you need to attend seriously. And then also to plan the in-store activities and execute uh, in-store activities. This can be local promotions or uh, special events. Uh, for instance, uh, if um, a store has a birthday or they want to have a celebration, it could be good for your brand to be highlighted uh, during that uh, promotion. And then comes this uh, 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 most important slide in this uh, presentation. And it is once you are listed and you are in, uh, in the store, uh, there are four drivers that drive growth in retail. And the first one is uh, penetration, meaning uh, distribution. This always comes first. You need to be in as many places as possible. 
And the second one is availability. And with that, it means to have the working with the right channels and also with the right banners where you are and to make the product also not only uh, available, mental available, but also physical available. So you have the right uh, channel strategy and you make the products easy to find, maybe also to have uh, a second placement and to stand out the shelf. And you, if you have a new product in a new category, it is uh, really important to uh, support in making a new destination in store. For instance, if you are a product uh, working with maybe uh, uh, vegan, uh, vegan red meals, uh, then it is uh, your chance of success increase if you support and help the retailers to make, make a destination in store. Or maybe you are having, um, uh, you have a range of uh, unique um, uh, spices uh, and you want to buy new, uh, to uh, make a new category of spices, then you uh, should support in making a destination in store. And by destination, I mean, uh, make the consumer understand where they can find your products in the store. This is uh, something you need to cooperate with the retailers about. The third one is category manager management. Uh, once you are in the store and you have listed your first three products, then uh, this work continues because maybe you want to have more products in the shelf and to have uh, an, uh, another three products. Then it is your job to know which three products to present for uh, the retailers next time. And here you need to understand uh, the entire assortment in the, in the, the, uh, in the entire assortment in the, in the shop at the retailer and uh, to see uh, uh, which products to uh, replace in the category where you can uh, uh, present your products instead. And here you need to understand the entire category. So it is not only your own products. And the fourth pillar for a successful growth is to support the brand. It is in all studies shows the correlation between brand awareness, how many consumers are aware about your product and sales. So it is a positive ROI to invest in the brand to have a, a, a rotation in the shelf. So if you master these four pillars, then it is a given success. And this is what everyone aimed for. And then uh, in next slide, it is an addition. It's not really about retail, but some you know, good recommendation. And uh, this is uh, uh, during my years, I have uh, uh, and there's some differences between Sweden and other markets when doing business. So here is just uh, some uh, recommendations uh, or um, explaining how we are. And in something in Swedish people, because I think it is because we're not so many in our market, uh, we trust each other from the first time we meet. We assume that you are a good person. <laughs> and we assume that everything you say is true. But don't misuse it, because then we will never forget <laughs> in, in that. But it is easy to trust someone in Sweden. Uh, it is, and you don't need to have everything in signing. We think long contracts, is, uh, that's a bit complicated. Keep it simple. And uh, we are also fully transparent. Uh, uh, as people, we are as clear as water in a glass. So uh, it is not often you see this with double agendas or you're not, uh, you're keeping um, information from people. Like uh, everyone in a company knows the financials, how it is going. And if you are doing business with another company in Sweden, it is super easy to get access to the financial reports. This is not secret. So when we are asking for your financial report, this is something we just do. It is not to be impolite or uh, being uh, curious about your business. It is just part of how we are. 
And we also see it as a give and take relationship. Sometimes you give and sometimes you uh, take. And it is like a bank account. So uh, we say it's a bank account of fairness. And this is um, working quite well. So uh, if someone asks you for a favor, you will automatically uh, get it in return later. And then we have, I think this is uh, the most uh, differentiator between the Swedish market and others. It is uh, time. And we have a special relationship to time and deadlines. You saw this just about the launch windows that we have all the suppliers launch at the same week in Sweden. And this is also important for us to respect deadlines. If you say that you will deliver something to a partner in Sweden a specific day, uh, it is in your favor if you do it the day before the deadline. And uh, if you do it the day after, we will never forget. And uh, then we are also uh, respectful. And this is shown uh, when it comes to invoices and payments, that if you uh, receive an invoice uh, with um, uh, paying dates, you get uh, 30 days, uh, then it is good if you pay it after 30 days and not 36 days, like in other countries. This is also something I, uh, I see as, uh, as something for our culture that we uh, pay invoices in, in time, not a few days after. And, uh, uh, and uh, when you're doing business, it is also between uh, people more than companies. And I think this is also because we are not so many people in the market. Uh, so it is often we, we tend to do business within our network. And uh, we also, this is like the time, time goes together with plans. We appreciate plans and uh, nothing beats a good plan. Uh, so that is also how to get everyone on board. And we have this, uh, we call it consensus uh, decisions uh, in, in Sweden. So uh, everything starts with a plan and we are not working with uh, hierarchies. We work with the hierarchy of the plan. So then we continue referring to the plan we have aligned in the beginning of a project. And then we also have something, uh, I think maybe in other countries also in Europe, but we have a high level of automatization and digitalization. When you are in contact with uh, authorities in Sweden, uh, like maybe in tax authorities or maybe with your partner for the warehouse or the customer, everything is uh, digital. So you do it uh, through an app or a website. And often you can do it in English as well as in Swedish. And also the last one, this also deserves a picture of its own, is that we, uh, we work often in partnerships. And here I see a difference between uh, Sweden and other markets. In Sweden, uh, uh, as a buyer, you see the supplier as a facilitator of growing your business, you know that the, you do a better business with a good partnership with your supplier. And it is not this uh, buyer and seller, it is more you are in a team together. And this is also a, a, a fruitful a mindset. And uh, from my experience, it often leads to an exponential growth. And then at last, I have a summary here, and it is there are um, uh, good opportunities to capture in the Nordics. And my advice is to make a plan before you go. And with that, I will say thank you very much for listening. And if you have any questions, please feel free to send me an email and I will do my best to come back to you. Do we have any questions now? Yes, we actually do. Wow, Jenny, thank you so much for, for your presentation, the good recommendations, and really an overview of what uh, the companies uh, should think about when entering 
the Swedish market. So once again, thank you so much. Um, Karin, would you like to help me reading out the questions to Absolutely. Jenny? Absolutely. Yes. Thank okay. You. Should we start? We have a question here from Hilda uh, and she has a question about private label. And she's wondering how does one go about creating a private label? Uh, then you start, if you have a product, uh, and here again, I recommend to uh, investigate the market to see what is already in the market. And then you make a value proposition directly to the retailers. And the good thing is that we only have three retailers. So you only need to uh, contact the retailers and to present your offer. Yes. Uh, and then Mario also have a question. He's wondering uh, what languages on the product label should be for the Scandinavian market? Should it be just one label for our market? Or should it be in different uh, languages? For if you have a product for the Nordic market, that's how I uh, interpret this, uh, you can have the, the, the Swedish. Uh, Swedish is also possible to have in Finland, but it is polite to also do it in Finnish, but it is not mandatory. So you can do Swedish. And uh, then we have a mix between Danish and Norwegian we call Scandinavian. And if you don't know Scandinavian, then it is Swedish, Danish, Norwegian. That is enough uh, because uh, it's enough. But if you want to be polite to the uh, Finnish people, you also add the Finnish language. So that depends on the sp uh, space on the packaging, I would say. Mm -hmm. uh, then we have another question from Hilda. And she's wondering, do the retailers buy in bulk and sell to smaller shops? Uh, no, they, they prefer to have it pre-packed, but there are uh, different players you can uh, cooperate with that buy bulk and pack for the retailers. Mm -hmm. Great. Then we also have a question um, that wondering from, from Anna, Healthy Tradition Anna. Uh, if we're going to sell in the Nordic countries, which languages should I mark in packages? That was the same question that you just answered. So let's yeah. take another yeah. one. I hope you um, yeah. feel like you got that answered, Anna. Um, let me see here. Uh, I think you had another question both regarding the, where can I find uh, data to understand my market volumes and peer companies' products, uh, companies products. Um, also from Anna. There are a few players in the, in the market, and there you can buy data from GFK, Kantar, or Nielsen. Did you get that? Kantar, Nielsen, GFK. And then also, you, we have this uh, statistics, uh, that national statistics. So if you uh, search for statistics, you can also find it, but that uh, data is a bit old. Yeah, and uh, Mario also asking uh, a question about information. Where can I find retail margins? Like where yeah, can I find uh, information uh, about ask that? <laughs> yeah, but then um, yeah. you cannot really find, uh, find it because then uh, you know it is their uh, business, um, uh, intelligence, but in general, if you uh, calculate 12% uh, VAT and 20% uh, for chilled, 30% for ambient, and for niche products, it is uh, between 40 and 50%. And for instance, confectionery have uh, 45% in average, but this also varies between the banners. This is just a you know, rule of thumb if you want to make a rough calculation before uh, deciding to enter the market. Yeah. Um, okay, I have a question here from uh, Diana. Uh, how can we know what Swedish, the Swedish market needs so we can work on us Lebanese small businesses? I think they're asking, what, what, how do we find like the gaps in the market? How can uh, we figure that out? Yeah, so uh, first you need to, um... Uh, understand what's already in the market and then you uh, what products it is and what pack sizes and what prices and then you map it and in the mapping you also divide it from the, the, the brands and the functions then when you have the map 
the the whole is often visualized for you. So you need to identify all the products in your category and um, uh, map the price, the function, uh, the brand, what the brand stands for. Hmm. We have another question from Mark. Um, he's asking if you can test your products in the Swedish markets. Yes, and there you also have several ways to do it. You can do it uh, with testing like um, uh, we have done it for, we do test sales in stores. Uh, to see, and then we uh, uh, see you have maybe six or eight stores, and then you sell it, and then after the you get the sales figures, and then you can um, uh, uh, draw a conclusion. I think that's the best way. Uh, another way is also to use uh, you can test the products in a Sims environment uh, among consumers, and then you select uh, maybe twelve hundred consumers. And they do the shopping in a simulated uh, environment. Or you can test it also with like Kantar. It's also a, a company doing tests. Yeah. Uh, Fred is asking if there are specific certificates needed for agri products um, other than the standard EEA ones for, sorry, for products from Kenya to Sweden. And all the retailers require BRC and uh, or FSSC, but uh, you need to have a, a scheme that proves uh, a production quality and traceability. Mm -hmm. uh, for, I have a question here from Agat. Uh, can you can your organization help? Um, with the registration for uh, with private standards? Uh, I don't know what private standards is, but we can support and register the products to in the Swedish market. If that is a question. Yeah, use the right if you want to add something to your question. Yeah, so then uh, yes, send me an email if it's. Yeah. Okay. Um, Osama has one. Is labeling guidelines same as EU, or there is something specific for the Nordics? There are ninety percent is the same, uh, but what's uh, specific is uh, how the allergens are marked, and we have this. Um, you you have this regulatory if you. Livsmedelsverket, um, uh, Constanza. And uh, do you know uh, Livsmedelsverket? Yeah, National uh, Food Agency. Yeah, yes, uh, ah, yeah, National ah, Food ah. Agency. They they have uh, information about labelings in English. And I would also like to highlight that we have a lot of uh, market reports in our webpage with the uh, labelling information and some certificates. So they can also um, go into our webpage to uh, read oh, that's a little good. Bit. Hmm? That's a good start because of, often you then um, at least you capture uh, the most important yes. information. Um, let's see. Um, our, Osama has a question regarding are there companies that will, uh, would help or advise in the processes? Uh, yeah, we do that. <laughs> That's what we do. <laughs> and there are other companies. So if you Google search, you will find more. So we are not, we are not alone. Um, from Elixir, um, are dietary supplements for health supporting sold in supermarkets? Uh, we produce and export syrups, food, gels, tablets, capsules. Thank you. So I think his question is if uh, are dietary supplements for health supporting sold in supermarkets here in Sweden? I think you would go to the health uh, channels. Uh, I assume I'm still sharing. Yes, you are. Yeah. So I will go back to because then you can take a screenshot. Yeah, uh, to see all the channels here. You have health stores. There, uh, the right to the right here. So that would be the best. And then you also have the, the pharmacies 
and in some stores, but I, I think that is, um, you can always try, but uh, my recommendation would be to try first with the health stores and then the pharmacies. Um, yes, we have another question from Janal. Uh, is there a database can be shared about potential distributors and importers in Sweden? Uh, his question is regarding if there is a database um, yeah. that we share importers, I think. Yeah, and because Sweden is a small uh, country, I, don't, I haven't seen any uh, database, but if I were you, I would search for a distributor. And then it comes up. I do that occasionally to just to get an overview of who is uh, distributing in, in Sweden. So if you search for uh, food and distributor. Mm. Uh, Fred here has a question. Uh, what is the reason for decreasing interest for sustainable products? Is it a trend or maybe due to inflation? Uh, I think it is uh, because of inflation and uh, lot, uh, when costs are going up, cost of living is increasing, people uh, tend to um, uh, decrease the cost from variable, uh, variable things and uh, the food cost is something you can affect for yourself. It's more difficult to maybe decrease the cost for electricity or using your car. So it is, I think it is because of the time where we are now. Mm -hmm. uh, Janal has a question. He's wondering if there is specific lab tests for agri-food products and any related food products that are mandatory for registration and market penetration. Uh, it could be the retailers, depending on the product, they sometimes have requirements. Uh, for instance, if it is uh, lentils or rice, you need to have some uh, tests uh, proving they are not uh, pesticides. But this is, is um, yeah, this is something you find out when you approach the retailer. Mm -hmm. um, Vlad is selling popcorn, or he's a popcorn producer. Oh, and he's yeah. asking about the snack market. Are snacks popular? How does it look like? The snacking category has been growing uh, every year since, since 2010. And every year I'm thinking, no, it can't grow anymore. So it is, uh, uh, it, it, like in other markets, it is growing. And we see uh, a new uh, uh, offering is entering the market. Uh, so um, the, if you have a new packaging or something, a new, maybe healthy popcorn or something. I uh, think there is an opportunity. Yeah. Uh, Oxy is asking: Is Sweden is the Swedish market interested in, in? I think bean pasta. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, in Ukraine, by small craft manufacturers, and how, and how we can communicate things. Um, I no, I don't know uh, the bean pasta itself um, but um, there are new options coming in and maybe uh, with a health um, aspect and I don't know uh, um, often it's more important to have a proven quality assurance scheme than a local production even though it is from Ukraine in. So maybe because now we want to support the Q Ukraine companies, so maybe it is something that can squeeze in between. So if I were you, I would try and just and ask the the retailers send an email to them. I'm also writing to Oxy that she can write to our email OTGS at commercialcollegium.se and maybe we can guide her. Uh, guide her through a little bit more. Yeah, that's um, yeah, yeah, good. Yes, and there are still popping in more questions. <laughs> and uh, we are actually uh, three minutes after three. And I'm thinking that we can take just the last question. What do you think, uh, Karin? And the rest we can try to answer by email since we will share the presentation. 
and uh, we have recorded this uh, webinar so we will also share it with all the participants mm -hmm. um let me see um Oh, we're coming in a lot of questions here. Let's yes. see. <laughs> um, oh, Elixir is asking, are there themed shelves in supermarkets? For example, a shelf of goods from Ukraine? Well, normally it is, uh, they have tried that to have it, um, you know, like from Italian or Spanish or Mediterranean. But now it is more from the category uh, itself, like pasta, sauces, um, uh, uh, cereals or, uh, or uh, more than country. But again, I think because where we are now in Ukraine, uh, I think uh, the buyers would like to support companies from Ukraine. So uh, my re recommendation would really be to send Constance an email and to see what we can do to support from here. Good. Thank you so much. Um, sorry if we cannot answer more questions. Uh, it's a good sign that we have received so many questions. So it's quite interesting uh, subject uh, and webinar. Uh, we will try to answer everything that we haven't answered yet uh, by email. But a big thank you once again to Jenny. Thank you so much. Karin also for reading out all the questions. And uh, well, to the rest of you, everybody that has joined us today, thank you so much. Uh, it has been a pleasure uh, to do this webinar together with Jenny. And uh, yeah, please reach out to us, otds at commercecollegium.se and also our webpage. And we will send out um, the presentation and the recording as soon as we can. So a big Goodbye. Thank you all for joining us. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.